Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. You may be seated. It's great to be here. Such an honor to be with all of you. Thank you for taking a Friday morning and coming to learn about home Bible studies. And uh, I see uh, pastors here that have taught many Bible studies, and I see people here that can teach Bible studies better than I can. But you know what? Uh, we can all get better. Uh, I wish I was better. Don't you, Brother Staten? Uh, every time somebody cancels a Bible study, every time somebody disappears and won't return my phone calls, I'm like, man, what did I do wrong? I wish I could have. What did I miss? I'm going to just kind of uh, be shotgun, and I'm going to start off broad, and by the time we get to Saturday, it'll be more focused, but, you know, it's kind of like playing golf. Everybody wants to go out on the golf course, and they want to know how to hit the ball 300 yards, right? That's what they want to start off knowing, and you can't teach somebody that's never played golf how to hit the ball 300 yards on the first lesson. You can't do it, and uh, just like uh, uh, you know, you want to cook that favorite recipe that your grandmother has, and he's like, okay, show me how to cook this pie. Well, it's not going to turn out like grandma's. Not the first time, right? Because uh, there, it, if it was easy, everybody would do it. If cooking was easy, everybody would be a gourmet chef. If hitting a golf ball 300 yards straight down the middle every time was good, we'd all be professional golfers. If teaching Bible studies and getting people converted was easy, we couldn't keep up with our building churches. If it was easy, Jesus would have done a better job. Hello? The end of his ministry, he could only get 120 to show up at church. And 500 saw him go up into heaven. And only 120 showed up. There may have been 500 the first day, but they had to wait 10 days for the Holy Ghost to fall. And some of them may have just drifted off, right? Uh, soul winning is not easy. If I've got a good note taker in here, could somebody really take good notes so I'll know what I said today? Because I, I, I'm going to try to, I'm going to feel around, and then I, what I didn't say today, I'll say tomorrow. Um, but you, I, if you're looking for a quick fix on how to teach home Bible studies, you're approaching it in the wrong way. And you're not going to be a good home Bible study teacher ever. If you think that there's a magic Bible study out there, exploring God's Word, search for truth to uh, bringing men to Jesus, into His marvelous light, two-day, five-day, 12-week, if you think there's a magic chart to win a soul, you, you're so far off, you're not even in the building. And I want, but you can learn it. Amen. You can learn how to win souls and teach Bible studies. But you may have to change your approach today. And I'm going to try to help you to maybe change your approach uh, a little bit. Maybe adjust it a little bit. If you go to get a golf lesson, uh, you never uh, hit the ball, then they're going to start off and it's going to be so boring because they're going to teach you they're going to start off you're just wanting to hit the ball a long ways okay and they're going to start off by telling you uh how to put your feet on the ground how to stand and how to hold the golf club and you're like when are we going to swing this thing you may have two or three lessons before you ever hit a ball you're like a lot of people they just don't go back if you've been hitting the ball and you, you can uh, uh, 
get around the golf course and you go take a lesson. When you take a lesson, you know what they're going to do? They're going to mess your game up. And then you won't even be able to hit the ball because you've been hitting it a little ways, but it's not repeatable. You may be lucked out and hit it. You know, there's some people going to be saved no matter what you do. They're just going to be saved. It doesn't matter how dirty the building is. It doesn't matter how bad you preach. It doesn't matter. Look at Jonah. Jonah shows up at Nineveh. He didn't have a burden. He hated those people. He said, repent or you're going to die. And he was mad at them. And, and you know what? They converted anyway. The whole city turned to God. And Jonah, Jonah loved plants more than he loved the people. Well, you may have converted a few people like that, but you know what? That's not repeatable. Some, you, you, you've got to learn how to systematically bring in a harvest. I really believe this about the harvest. I believe Jesus compared it to fishing and farming. Uh, he, he said, I'll make you to become fishers of men. He was not talking about uh, people that go out and catch a bass several once in a while. If I go fishing, I'm going fishing in Alaska here in a couple of weeks, and, uh, you know, I, I hope I catch a fish. I'm going to have fun, but you know what? I'm going to eat whether I catch a fish or not. I'm not going to starve to death if I don't catch a fish. I'll be all right. I'll be home with a house full of groceries and I still got a job and all of that. But he was talking to commercial fishermen. He said, I'll make you to become fishers of men. Uh, uh, there are people out there that fish for a living. And that's what Jesus was talking about. They, uh, commercial fishermen isn't guessing whether or not he's going to catch fish. He knows how to catch fish. He's got a process. He doesn't have to think a whole lot about what he's going to do in the morning. He may have to make some calculations about weather. He may have to decide what fish he's going after that day and what equipment to put on the boat. But once those decisions are made, he knows what to do because he's done it for years. And he knows it'll work if some uh, young kid that he just hired gets on the boat and says, hey, I don't think this is right. I think we ought to do it this way. He's going to say, how many fish have you caught? He said, just, just do it my way, and that's what we're going to do because i got to pay the boat payment. i got to send my kids to school. I've got to pay my mortgage, and I know how to catch fish. And he doesn't change all the time. He does what works. Same way with farming. If you, uh, if I grow a couple of tomato plants, he talked about throwing tomato seeds out. That's about the extent of my farming right there. I throw out some tomato seeds. Uh, uh, but it, if I do decide to plant some tomatoes and I don't do something right and they don't grow, I, I know where to go get more tomatoes. I go buy them at the store. I, I'm not trying to feed myself. So I'm not a farmer no matter what it looks like or what I'm trying... He, Jesus wasn't talking about that kind of planting. He was talking to commercial farmers that made a living planting. The, there are principles in the harvest that, of souls that uh, are repeatable and predictable. Now, there's a lot of things you don't control about fishing. There's a lot of things you don't control about farming. And there's a lot of things you don't control about the harvest of souls. But that, just because it rained your crop out that year doesn't mean you didn't plant right. It means that was something that was out of your control. The Missouri River is flooding this year, and there's a lot of bottomland that can't be planted in corn this year. They're not going to have a harvest. That's not their fault. That doesn't mean they don't know how to farm. They know how to grow corn. But something happened outside their control. That happens. Fishing happens that way. Water temperature changes. Uh, maybe there's a predator there. Maybe there's pollution that gets in your favorite fishing hole. And there's things you don't control, and you can't worry about that. But see, if you don't know how to... In the harvest of souls, there are 
disasters that happen. There's things outside of your control. But, you know, the farmers in Missouri with that rich bottom land, they're not sitting around the table wringing their hands today going, I don't know why I'm just a failure. I don't know how to farm. I don't, we're not going to have any corn this year. And honey, I don't know what to do. Uh, maybe I ought to go be a carpenter. No, they're like, it flooded. Maybe it won't flood next year. We're going to do the same thing. They may have to deal with whatever financial implications that's having on their life. They've got to, but they're not deeply questioning. See? Now, in the harvest of souls, you've got to get to a level to where you know, Brother Staten, when to be upset and when not to be upset. Right? There are times you need to be upset, okay, because you made a mistake. Uh, maybe there's times when you got caught up and you wanted to go fishing and you should have been planting. And so you've got the seed in the ground two weeks late. That's your fault. Okay? And you can correct that. But you have to know what to correct, when to be upset, when to change your methods. Uh, you know, it, things change. And if uh, you, a farmer gets a new piece of ground and he tries to do the same thing on this piece of ground that he did over here... Uh, the soil composition may be different. He may have to adjust his methods, and you need to, you're going to have to adjust your method. Let's look at the scripture, see what the scripture says about uh, this. Let's go to, um, Isaiah chapter 28. Uh, I don't have the, I have the scripture printed out here. I don't have it verse by verse, so I don't, I won't know exactly what verse number I'm in. I think I'm starting with verse 23. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 23. Give ear and hear my voice. Hearken and hear my speech. Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of his ground? When he hath made plain the face thereof, doth he he not cast abroad the fitches and scatter the cumin and cast in the principal wheat and the appointed barley and the rye in their place. For his God doth instruct him to discretion and doth teach him, for the fitches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cartwheel turned about upon the cumin, but the fitches are beat out, beaten out with a staff and the cumin with a rod, but Bread corn is bruised because he will not ever be threshing it, nor break it with the wheel of his cart, nor bruise it with his horsemen. This also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. Let me just read it out of the ESV. Give ear and hear my voice, give attention and hear my speech. Does he who plows for sowing plow continually? Does he continually open and harrow his ground when he has leveled its surface? Does he not scatter deal, sow cumin, and put wheat in rows, and barley in its proper place, and emmer as the border? For he is rightly instructed, his God teaches him. Deal is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over cumin. But deal is beaten out with a stick, and cumin with a rod doth one crushed grain for bread? No, he does not thresh it forever. When he drives his cartwheel over it with his horses, he does not crush it. There al this also cometh from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. Now, Christ is the true vine. His, uh, he is the husbandman. God's church is the Lord's husbandry. Okay, it's his... Uh, uh, field, so to speak, and God is continually cultivating it. And here, Isaiah says, there's different things that you do to grow things. And so, this is the garden of God. There's sometimes it's time to plow, but then it's time to stop plowing. It's time, there's certain crops, certain people that uh, 
uh, you have to drive over them with a threshing slit. <laughs> There are other people that just gingerly, you kind of try to move them along. You, it, they're, they're a tender crop. You've got to know that. Now, in agriculture, the Jews, you know, if you go back into uh, history, you study uh, uh, idolatry, especially in cultures that uh, worship false gods. Uh, a lot of times they uh, worship the sun they worship uh, the gods that send the rain because it's their agricultural society 90 percent of all of the world for 90 percent of the time of human history agriculture has been the center and people grew their own food and they had to live and and so if the rain didn't come they died right if the, if, if the weather wasn't right. So they had all of they, the gods they worshiped, the god and goddesses of fer, fertility, okay, uh, that, because they thought that's where all of this goodness comes from. But the Jews, of course, they didn't believe that. They believed that God taught Adam how to cultivate the ground. When Adam was kicked out of the garden, uh, uh, he didn't have any kind of knowledge about how to grow things, right? And so the Jews believe that, that knowing how to cultivate the ground, knowing what crops to plant and how to do it, God directly taught Adam all of that. And from Adam, that was passed down throughout the generations. And so, that's, so agriculture, the knowledge of agriculture, came from God. And this is what uh, is alluding to in Isaiah. He said, his God teaches him. Uh, this, this knowledge comes from the Lord. Now, if the knowledge of growing natural things came from God, then the knowledge of how to reap his harvest of souls also has to come from him. And God will teach us. Come on, do you believe that? God will teach you how to cultivate the plot of ground that God has given you. You are working in a field that is unique. There's nobody else working in the field that you are laboring in. It's, there's, there's no one of us in here Unless you're all from a local church and you live in the same neighborhood. But you know what? Your backgrounds are different and the people you're talking to and the place you work is different than the place your neighbor. We're just dealing with different ground all the time and, and different people and so different crops. And so we have to depend on God to teach us how this happens. I mean, there... And, and, and what I'm going to do this week is teach you, you know, the, the basics of plowing, planting, and, you know, the watering and, and, and all that. But there's an application of that in your particular context. And if it was easy and formulaic, everybody would be doing it. And so I... I, I'm spending a lot of time on building this foundation because uh, you, you're never going to be a long-term uh, productive soul winner. And, and home Bible studies are, are never going to produce what you want them to produce unless you approach this with some deep humility. Deep humility. Every soul is different. I don't think it's an exaggeration, brother, statement to say that every Bible study you teach, you'll teach it in a little bit different fashion. Every time. I mean, you show up, uh, an experienced home Bible study teacher like myself, I show up with a whole bag of tools that I know how to use. Okay? But I don't just whip out the tools and start going to work. I've got to figure out what am I dealing with here. 
because I am just the worker. He's the Lord of the harvest. He's my boss. I'm working in his field. That's not my field. That's his field. He sent me to labor in it. And so, God, what do you want me to do? How am I going to approach this? Is, uh, does, is this time for plowing? Is it time for planting? It, uh, what do I need to be doing? And that's why you, you, it has to be prayerful. Uh, when <clears throat> Teaching a home Bible study may be one of the most important things that happens in the work of God because it's planting the seed. The Word converts the soul. I'll talk more about this later, but it's the Word of God that converts the soul. And so the Word of God has to be implanted. It's that Word that coming to uh, fruition. It, it's that Word that makes that conversion happen. And so it, it, people don't convert because they like you. People don't convert because, uh, you know, you've created community. People don't convert because they get involved. People convert because the word gets implanted in them somewhere Somehow, some way. Brother Wright, perfect example. Throwing seed out on carpet looks like planting, but it's not planting. In some people's house, a one of those seeds might come up. <laughs> there might be enough dirt down there <laughs> to germinate a seed. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but uh, generally speaking, it's not going to happen. And so he, here's what we've got to do when we're teaching Bible studies is to most effectively plant in every type of soil and learn as much as we can. It starts out with the man, right? Uh, uh, planting, fishing, whatever. It starts out with you. What kind of character do you have? What, what, how are you approaching it? this Bible study. Uh, some people are lazy. That's why they can't grow anything. They're sloppy in their application of the fertilizer and whatever else goes. They're not systematic and careful about it. Maybe they're just a hireling. Maybe they're like, I just got to get all, I got to get this bucket empty. Let's just dump it out here and get it emptied. And now I did my job. I, let me go collect my paycheck. Some people just want, want to teach a Bible study so they can check it off of a list somewhere. They can, uh, I, I, I have, I, I'm a fifth generation apostolic, so I, I, was, uh, I was taught you don't talk to sinners, right? I mean, I was kept away from sinners my whole life. Don't be around them. And I'm glad that God sheltered, that my parents wanted to shelter me from the world. They didn't want that influence. They, they put me in a safe place in the church and, and protected me. The unintended consequence uh, is I didn't get to talk to sinners. Uh, it, it was uh, not that they didn't want me to talk to sinners. It's just the unintended consequences of them trying to keep me safe. And uh, so I, I went through uh, my whole growing up. My, all of my friends were apostolic. Uh, my parents didn't know what was going on at uh, people's house in the neighborhood that wasn't in church. And so uh, I wasn't going over there. There might be alcohol in the house. They might be watching stuff on TV we shouldn't watch. And so they were protecting me from that. But the, con the result of that was that... Uh, I'm 21 years old in Detroit, Michigan, full-time uh, youth pastor, and I don't know how to talk to people that aren't apostolic. Don't know how to relate to them. Don't. And so God, at the same time, is calling me to be a missionary. 
I went to Ypsilanti thinking I was going to be a global missionary. I've always felt a call to missions. Uh, I, I would just weep every mission service. I had a burden for French Guiana, and I prayed for it. I thought I, I was trying to take French. Uh, I took a couple years of French, and I kept, uh, uh, I'm just, well, Scott, you're going to have to learn French because you're going to be a missionary. And I, I just felt that calling. And, but I didn't know how to win a soul. Never won a soul. I had taught some Bible studies, but uh, I can't say they produced anything. I met a man one time who taught 300 Bible studies and hadn't had a conversion. Whew. I felt sorry for him, and then, and I, then I got mad at him. <clears throat> like, what in the world? <laughs> if you were, if you owned a plot of ground and you had a laborer out there, and he had wasted all that seed and there was no crop, I said, "What are you doing?" That's what Jesus did. That guy had one talent. He came back and said, "What? What have you been doing with this talent? It's buried." Uh, Anyway, I knew I had to do something about it. And the good news is you can learn to be a soul winner. You can learn to be a soul winner. Now, some people, there are, there are elements, and Brother Staten's teaching on soul winning, but it's hard to separate soul winning and Bible study. And so it's all part of it. So we'll... Uh, if I'm teaching your stuff, you can teach something mine tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but uh, you can learn it. Uh, there are parts of it that is, some people have more natural ability. You have to make a connection with people. You, you have to meet people. I mean, uh, I talked last night about being an introvert. Well, you got to pray through being an inter introvert. You've got to talk to people. You've got to talk to people. Well, that's, that's part of it. That may not be as easy for you. But there's other guys that may be easy to talk to, but there's other parts hard for them. Okay? Uh, You've you got to push people. At some point, if, you go, if somebody's going to be converted, you've got to bring them to a decision. You've got to say, are you going to be baptized today? Yes. Let's do it right now. I got clothes for you right now. Yes. That's hard for some people. That's not hard for me. Right? Uh, some people, uh, they just make that connection, and they, they, they just do not want to experience that rejection. And so they delay, 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 delay. And they got people who've been going to church with them for six years. They've been investing in, and they never have baptized them. So that's okay. You'll get better at saying, let's get baptized today. You'll get better at it. You'll have to work on it. But you'll get better at it. And so there, but you can learn it. No matter what uh, part of it is more difficult for you, you can learn it. You'll never learn it, though, if it's not important to you. And that's why some people never become a soul winner, is because there's enough people winning souls, they don't feel like they have to. And that's something that's got to get inside of you that you have to decide, I've got to do this. This is the mission of God, and I must be involved in it. I remember uh, the day that happened for me, Brother Staten. Um, I loved hanging around the young people. I knew what to do with apostolic young people. I knew how to... Uh, go hang out with them, play basketball with them, teach them, deal with their problems. All of that, I was trained to do all of that and could do it, and that was comfortable. But lost people. Once lost people got saved, then I could knew what to do with them. 
And I was, you know, when you're in a larger church, there's somebody that's out there doing that, you know. And, and I'm not against the division of labor. I'm not saying everybody has to be me. But I do think everybody has to be involved in soul winning. And so uh, my wife and kids had gone to uh, see my mother. I was home alone. I was watching a Because of the Times video, Brother Jeff Arnold. And at the end of that, I'm laying on my face in my living room. And I prayed this prayer. I said, God, I don't love people. I said, I am doing outreach. I'm knocking doors. But I am not moved with compassion on people like you were moved with compassion. Saturday door knocking and outreach was more of a chore to get through than it was any kind of expectation that something good might happen or it was I was wanting to get through it check the box get back home get back in my comfortable cocoon and whew. and I knew that wasn't what Jesus did Jesus that, that's what the disciples did. They were always trying to get Jesus away from the crowd. Come on, get in the boat. We'll go out in the middle of the lake so these people can't bother you. And Jesus kind of looked at him like, what are you talking about? And he's standing up in the boat teaching the people. He, Jesus reaching to the shore for the people. The disciples just steady trying to get away from people. Children, get these children away from here. And Jesus like, what are you talking about? If you don't become like a little child, you're not even going to be in part of the kingdom. Simon Peter trying to cut Malchus's head off. Jesus picking the ear up. Simon Peter missed. He didn't mean to cut his ear off. He puts his ear back on. And you just see Jesus scratch his head. What is wrong with these people? And that was me. I was that disciple. I loved Jesus. But I didn't love what Jesus loved. There's a difference. There's a difference. And I'll, I'll never forget it. I'll just tell you how I, I felt it happen. I felt my front door open. I felt the pressure change in the room. And... I felt his footsteps. I was afraid to look up because I just knew I would see Jesus. And he touched me. And I've never been the same. He put a love for people in my soul. The best way I can describe it, you know, when the birth of my first child, the minute that child was born, I loved that kid as much as was in my capacity. I do not love him now, 30 years later, one bit more than I loved him then. It happened in a moment. Anybody that's ever uh, had a stillborn child or a child that lived maybe even an hour? Unless you've been through that, you can't comprehend. He's like, oh, well, well, they didn't only know the child. An hour is sad. It, it, but, but, but no, it's just as if that child had lived for 30 years. There's no little bit of love about it. It's a child that's born. God can put that love for people in you. When you love people, you won't think about running the plow share, or the, the threshing wheel over them if you think it'll hurt them. When you love people and you care for people, you approach that whole different way because you'll 
love them like Jesus loved them. You look at the different ways that Jesus dealt with people from turning over the tables, uh, the money changers, to chewing out the Pharisees, to looking up in the tree, saying, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. Different ways that he modified his approach because of the value of a soul. And so we're trying to plant precious seed. Don't you believe the word is precious? It's precious seed. It's life. You're not to throw your pearls before swine. It, 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 the, the seed of God's word is precious. And, and, and that's why you, you've got to make sure that, you know, you don't have to know everything about the Bible to be a good home Bible study teacher, but you have to be serious about studying the Bible. You have to know, a, you, 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 study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. When you understand the value of the word of God and the, how powerful it is, um, the, the seed of God's word is central to the whole thing. The seed of God's word works. It's not, this is not about personality. It's not about technique. It's about the power of the word. Um, there are people that don't believe, uh, uh, I wouldn't say they don't believe in home Bible study, but they're skeptical about home Bible studies. I've heard them say it to me. Well, I don't teach home Bible study. Well, you know, uh, people can be saved without a home Bible study, okay? Uh, but they can't be saved without the Word. A home Bible study is simply the most effective method I know of to implant the Word of God in somebody's heart. Uh, the apostles did it that way. We have a pattern. They, they taught publicly and from house to house. Teaching the Word of God in somebody's home is an apostolic activity. It's not a technique. And even if... You, uh, somebody is converted without ever anybody teaching in their home, eventually in that discipleship process, somebody needs to teach the word in their home because that's the apostolic pattern, publicly and house to house. And, and so uh, people can get the word of God implanted in different ways. The church I grew up in was not what you would call a home Bible study teaching church. But we lived in the buckle of the Bible belt. And so everybody was going to find a church to go to on Sunday. People were just going to be in church on Sunday. It was a church going place. And so people would come to church and, and they would hear a sermon and they would hear the word. And back then people would come to church sometimes enough times that they would hear enough word that without anybody teaching them in a Bible study, they would get enough word to be converted. Now there's a little formula. I don't know. I wish I knew. I, all I know uh, about it is uh, X plus X equals conversion. I don't know what the X's are. Okay, but the, uh, there's a certain amount of word mixed with a certain amount of faith that produces a conversion. And when a person gets enough word, and if they have any faith, that's going to produce a conversion. It will. And so the trick is to get people to sit still long enough to get enough word. We're adults here. I used to uh, tell kids when I was youth pastor, I said, listen, be careful, you kids that are dating, how many, much time you spend together. Because X amount of time together is going to lead to... Yeah. And so you better make sure you don't hit that time together because that God, God made it that way. Right? There's nothing wrong with it in the proper context, but you have to wait for the proper context. And so uh, keep teaching the Word. 
keep teaching the Word because it's going to produce a result in somebody's life. Now, everybody has, a, has the ability to reject God. And that's out of your control. That, your job is to bring them to that place. And I never, I always feel bad about it. I always grieve about it. But I don't ask what's wrong with me when somebody clearly says, yes, pastor, I see that, but I don't believe it. Well, that's your, that's, and, and I, will, I go back through it again. Now, you understand uh, this scripture? You understand that scripture? It was on baptism. I'll go through it. Yes, I understand. I don't believe that's what that says. Okay. Do you want me to explain it to you one more time? No, I got it. And I'm not doing it. Okay. They did that to Jesus. You can't feel bad about that. People are going to reject you. You're not going to have a success with every Bible study. But you keep on putting the word in. You keep on putting the word in. That's your job. Don't let people uh, talk to you about fishing and hunting for the whole hour you're in their house. You've got to figure out how to get them talking about the word. Because people are not converted but talking about hunting and fishing. And I've been to Bible study before. I walk out just frustrated because I couldn't get them. In fact, we was teaching Bible study. I told my wife, I said, you know what? They're not going to make it, baby. They will not let me talk to them about the word. They just won't. I, and, and you leave knowing they're not going to be saved. Because we just spent an hour and a half and didn't talk about the Word. Eventually, I quit going over. I, drinking coffee with people don't save people. And it may save somebody if drinking coffee allows you to teach the Word. But if you're just drinking coffee, stay home. Drink coffee with your wife. Fine. I was... Driving one day, I was coming home from work. It's about 4:30, 5 o'clock, and I get a call from a kid I've been working with. Pastor, I I need to talk to you. If you got any time to see, I said, Sure, Sean, I'll pick you. I'm headed home. I'll swing by. I'll pick you up. We'll go have something to eat. And he wanted to talk to me, and I'm trying to pull him, you know. And he, so I'm driving along, and I call Carla, and I said, Hey, babe, I'm I'm gonna go. Uh, have dinner with uh, Sean, and uh, she was kind of quiet on the phone. I said, well, you know, he wants to see me, and he, he, she said, how many times you had dinner with Sean? Well, a lot. I said, she said, what you really need to do is come home and have dinner with your own kids. She said, Sean's not listening to you. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll be home in a few minutes. <laughs> you know, one more time, I knew I was going to go to dinner, Brother State, just hoping he'd listen to me this time. But you know what? He was just wanting to talk. He wanted to get ammunition against his parents is what he wanted to do. He wanted to give me all his side and let me say something that he could use against his mom and dad. You know, some people are just lonely. They just want to go have coffee. They're not hungry for the Word of God. They're just hungry for fellowship. And they're just keeping you from somebody that's hungry. The Word. Is the Word working? Well, I, I'm, I'm on purpose scattered. I'll be more systematic next day. But I, I want to make sure that you're not just saying, How do I hit the ball 300 yards? Because you won't hear anything I say in the next sessions if you don't get that this is more art than it is science. There's so many moving parts. You know, uh, I'm 52. I'm at the dawn of the computer age, right? Uh, we didn't have one computer in my high school. And so I was just on that edge there and before then things had been simple kind of mechanically right I mean things were in an analog world is just more simple and you could work on cars and 
they didn't have any electric, uh, any electronic parts and stuff. It was all, and so a lot of people knew how to work on cars. You know, they called them shade tree mechanics. You just worked under the car under the shade tree. You know, and and so, but with the man, now we live in such a complex world. You know, it just one thing just aggravated the fire out of me. My computer wouldn't work, and they'd say. They never would say, well, here's what's wrong. You just fix the Framistam uh, Duma floppy deal and <laughs> replace that, and it'll work. No. They say, well, we, it may be. We'll try this. Well, we'll run X, Y, Z. And, and if they fixed it, they didn't know why, how they fixed it. It just <laughs> fixed Oh, that just drove me crazy. Until finally I just realized, okay, it's complex. Don't know why the website crashed. We want to know, why did it crash? Nobody knows why the website crashed. There's too many moving parts, right? Well, humans are like that sometimes. That's just a bunch of moving parts. You're dealing with somebody... You, you're teaching a Bible study to a 50-year-old person. You're dealing with 50 years of history. You're dealing with, don't tell them what you're dealing with. God's got to help you. His Word's got the answer. The Word works. We don't even know how the Word works. Let's, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. This is, this is one of my favorite uh, church planning scriptures right here. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Um, I don't think I've got it here. It's 11 and, yeah, here it is, 1 through 6. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Boy, you're not going to like this, but listen to it. This is the word. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind shall not sow. He that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, in the evening withhold not thy hand. For thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall alike be good. Boy, that's a real home Bible study seminar, isn't it? You don't know anything, just sow out there. If it looks like it's going to rain, don't worry about it, just sow anyway, just, just do it. Then he says this, you don't know how a child grows in the womb. Now we know the mechanics of that. Right? We know how uh, a child is conceived. We know it gestates for nine months. We know one first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, even science. We know when the heartbeat does. We know the brain. Does. We know a lot about the process. Scientists, we, we're down to uh, the DNA. We know about, we don't know how DNA works. Medical science, they have no idea how they know what happens. They don't know how it happens. They know the egg and the sperm unite, the DNA fuse. They don't know how that happens. They know what happens and how the bones are knit together in the womb and how that grows to be a, a child that's born. But there's a miraculous component about it that it's inscrutable. You'll never know exactly what happens. And that's the same way with home Bible study teaching. Yes, I, we can teach you the mechanics and how, what you should look for and the process and, 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 and all of that. But there is a work of the Spirit that's going on. That's, a, a, a new birth is happening. And a... Child is growing in the womb of God, a new believer. There's a certain part of that you are just not in charge of. There's so many things we can do. But at the end of the day, this is God's child. 
Not yours. A lot of uh, church planners, a lot of soul winners even. Well, these are my babies. No, they're not your babies. Not even close. That's, that's, that's such wrong language. That's not your baby. That's God's baby. That's God's baby. And God wants that baby to grow to maturity. He's got a plan for them. That affects your effectiveness as a home Bible study teacher. This is, you're, you're not a, uh, what time do I stop here? Pardon? 11. Okay, I got five minutes. Uh, if you don't understand that and approach it in that manner, with that the level of what I've tried to communicate to you today is the complexity of it. You know, uh, we don't, we're careful about giving 16-year-olds the keys to the car. Because driving is complex. There's a lot of moving parts, right? You not only got to know about the vehicle, you got you to know all the traffic laws, you got to know all of that, but you got to watch other people. I mean, it, it's complex. And it can have serious consequences. One a careless moment and you can you know do something horrible like wipe out a family of five it's a serious thing and the reason we are hesitant about giving the keys to 16 year olds is because we want to make sure they know how serious this is and if they're they're just going 90 miles an hour down a side street and they're just acting like, oh, I got this thing, they're cocky and they got it. You're not getting the keys yet because you don't have an appreciation of it. And what I'm trying to do this morning is talk to you about home Bible studies in a way that you'll say, whoa, wait a minute. This is serious business. There's a soul at stake here. All of heaven is watching. There, there, eternity is at stake. Maybe generations of, uh, uh, of people are at stake over this Bible study. Uh, the, the, the Bible study that you're teaching, it's the first lesson. You can't even pronounce their last name yet. That could be a church that's going to be there for a hundred years. That one seed that you're about to plant could blossom into a church that's going to... You, you never know what's going to happen when you walk in to teach that Bible study. And it's a responsibility. And uh, there, there's no pat answer to everything. If, if Jesus taught Bible studies to people, think about... The rich young ruler, he, I mean, it, and I'm going to preach about this tonight. People have to be persuaded in their own mind. That's, they have to be. That's, and that's what you're, you're there to do is to persuade them to believe the word of God. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well, uh, I, I will tell you this. There's no greater thing that you can do than to sit down. It's, that's the work of God. I, 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 as I said last night, I love what I do, but I'm going to tell you, I, I, what I'm doing is trying to help you all do the real work better. Okay, I'm trying to produce more materials. I'm trying to get more resources so that somebody's got to go do the real work. Okay, some, and the real work is when you show up in somebody's house and you're eye to eye with the Word of God with them and you're trying to persuade them. Yes, sir. Yes. That's the work of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's stand. Amen. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll help us. Come on, let's lift our hands. God, give us an understanding of home Bible studies and what we're doing, God. It's not a technique, God, but it is handling your precious seed, your precious word. It is the very words of life, God. 
Lord, you've called us. You have put that responsibility in our hands, God. Help us to take it uh, as seriously, Lord, as you did, oh God. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We thank you. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise.